When emergency first responders were overwhelmed by Los Angeles County's most destructive fire yet, a band of surfers, along with their neighbors and friends, stepped up to defend their home turf in Malibu. Their devotion to home drove them to show up for their community during the fire and for years afterward. And now, a model they call the Community Brigade Program could change everything leading to more lives and more homes saved during the increasing wildfires across not just California, but the world. Join reporter Adriana Cargill from KCRW, NPR's All Things Considered, Crooked Media, and more, as she investigates a wildfire story that is not depressing, but is, in fact, a clear hope for the future. Listen now to Sandcastles, an award-winning podcast about home, how we create it, and why we fight so hard for it. Welcome to Important Not Important. My name is Quinn Emmett. And my name is Brian Colbert Kennedy. Mm-hmm. And that's what he tells that's us. That's what I'm telling you. Uh, this is the uh, podcast yeah. where we give you the tools that you need to fight for a better future for everyone. The context mm-hmm. straight from, I mean, some of the smartest people on earth and, and <sighs> the action steps that you can take to support them. That's right. And, and those people are scientists, doctors, Nurses, journalists, engineers, uh, farmers, educators, politicians, activists, business leaders, astronauts, even a reverend. Wait, a reverend. Even a reverend. Yep. Uh, And this is, by the way, your friendly reminder right now. This is it. That you can send questions, Mm -hmm. thoughts, and feedback to us on Twitter at importantnotimp, or just email us at funtalk at importantnotimportant.com. That's right. It's so exciting to have another season going here for you guys or whatever it is. I mean, season, I, we're not really officially calling it that, but yeah. the fact is we're, we're doing it. We're doing it again for a while here. So uh, let us know how it's going and uh, other things you want to talk about. Uh, you can also stay up with the news and get action steps on that. You can join tens of thousands of other f- smart folks and uh, subscribe to our free weekly newsletter. And that's at important, not important, uh, dot com. Brian. On this week's episode... This- That's right. We're headed off to climate school. That's right. We got our owls. Oh, God. We're headed off to climate school. And our guest today, Brian. Yep. uh, He's like Dumbledore, Mm. uh, but for climate. And also, unlike Dumbledore, he won't abandon you in your time of need over and over. I know that's complicated. I get it. He had a plan from the start. Would have just been helpful to fill Harry in a little bit. Anyways, different episode, different conversation. Anyways, uh, Anshuman Bapna is here. And he's uh, here to talk about his new venture uh, with Climate School and how you can get involved. Truly one of the most eloquent speakers on this that I think we've, uh, we've talked to. His perspective is truly something else. And I, and I think will help a lot of people, a lot of people identify with ways that they can get into this thing if they've been searching for how that might be. Absolutely. What a great convo. And just like you said, yeah, I mean, I just want, I could just listen to him all day. Yeah. Yeah. We basically kept him here all day. Anyways. Yeah. Uh, let's go talk to Anshman. Okay, bye. All right, bye-bye. Our guest today is Anshuman Bapna, and together we're going to talk about how to teach climate change. Uh, Anshuman, welcome. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, glad to be on the podcast. Yes, this is going to be fantastic. <laughs> Anshuman, can you give our listeners a, just a brief, uh, introduction, just to, just who you are and what you do? Sure. So I've been an internet entrepreneur most of my life. But just like uh, half of the planet now thinking about climate for some time now. And then over the past year, just ditched everything that I've been working on, trying to figure out what's uh, important, uh, but not so important uh, way of of approaching this problem. And uh, finally found that uh, there were many, many more people like me uh, who were trying to get into climate and uh, not knowing where to begin. So I thought I might as well solve the problem for myself and for everyone else and ended up building this uh, new company called uh, Terra.do, uh, do as in doing, uh, which is just an online climate school trying to get lots and lots of people like me to learn about climate and get, get working. I love it. I love it. it. It seems so obvious that it's something we should be doing. And yet it's, uh, it's, it's crazy that it's just kind of been all ad hoc for now no real systematized way of doing it, which is something I'm really excited to get into because I've got beef with a lot of people about it. (laughs) Um, Yeah, is there a way uh, that we can force everybody to attend your school? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, hey, Anjuman, could, could you just uh, spend a couple minutes telling us kind of how you got there? Because you, you've had a pretty, and, and I loved hearing about in our offline conversation, sort of, the, I guess, the, the 10 years or so that preceded uh, your decision to do this, you know, going back and forth to India and, uh, you know, working in business and things like that and, and how that kind of led up to this. Because I think that's something that will be compelling to folks as they decide how they can make their dent and, you know, including getting educated at Teradu. Sure. Yeah. So I grew up in small town India and small town in India is still a big town in the rest of the world, at least in terms of people. And, uh, so all kinds of uh, interesting things happening around me in agriculture, in the social sector, both my parents were doctors, but working in the hinterlands. And so a very different kind of world altogether that I grew up in. Then um, went to uh, undergrad in the big glitzy city of Bombay, uh, Bollywood, uh, glamour, all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, however, in a, in a very uh, boring place, which was an engineering college called IIT Bombay, uh, turned out to be much more interesting than I thought because that was around the time when the first uh, boom and bust of the internet was happening. So that big wave that started out in 1996 with Netscape's IPO and uh, then crested with the massive NASDAQ crash uh, in 2000, I was very much in the middle of that. And as an undergrad, I ended up uh, starting my own company while I was still in college with two more of my friends. Um, one of them is my co-founder again. So clearly I did... Uh, uh, I did not dissuade him enough to stay away from me <laughs> forever. But uh, yeah, so we raised money literally a couple of weeks before the Nasdaq crash. And then, of course, everything uh, uh, burned down to the ground around us for the next uh, one year. Managed to somehow come out of that unscathed and sold the company. Then uh, decided to come to the last refuge of the scoundrel, which is to go to business school when you can't figure out what to do with your life. And ended up uh, here in sunny California at Stanford, which was really fun because uh, you suddenly come into a place where uh, you have so many different types of people uh, from all different disciplines trying to solve often similar things. And so all this whole cross-disciplinary stuff really stuck with me and ended up doing a ton of different things, including going to Vietnam for the summer, trying to sell solar lights to poor farmers who had much better things to do with their money than to buy what I was selling them, um, or working with a non-profit pharmaceutical firm here in San Francisco, which is an oxymoron, but a fantastic okay. idea. Then um, I wanted to pay off my tuition, so ended up in consulting for a couple of years in the office of a bit of a disaster. Just didn't seem like the right place for someone like me. Uh, I was trying to convince someone else to start a company with me uh, here in New York. And uh, instead, they convinced me to join Google. And Google was really much more fun, I think, because for the food was terrific. So I finally put on lots of pounds. But <laughs> it was terrific. I, I, I also realized I mean, how, how much uh, of uh, everything around you can be questioned if you were to ask from first principles. And I saw tons of examples of that while I was at Google. So that was quite enlightening. And while all of this was happening, and I was, uh, I married my childhood sweetheart, and there was a third life I was living, which was, uh, I was running a nonprofit in India at the same time, where I had worked with a politician uh, for a summer. And India's uh, political system is very unusual. Things have changed a little bit, but uh, typically you would not find professionals or people who, are, uh, who don't have political ambitions working in politics at all in India. And uh, that was one of the things that I realized that uh, there was this massive gap. So if you just brought people who had done some business thinking and uh, were just much more organized about uh, getting stuff done, you could be working with someone who was uh, running a constituency of four to five million people. And it's literally the same amount of impact you could have in a very short period of time. And of course, there's a flip side of that, which is that if you don't get it right and you're experimenting with uh, uh, with, with what you're doing, then you also have that many guinea pigs. And that's kind of unfortunately the story of Indian democracy. But I ran that for about eight years and worked on some really interesting legislation, including uh, one of the most famous ones called Right to Information, uh, which was uh, which completely changed how citizens had access to holding governments accountable in India. So while that, all, all of this was going on, then uh, uh, we were loving New York. New York is such a beautiful, fantastic place still my favorite city in the world. And our daughter was born 
And paradoxically, within a month of that, I had a light bulb moment go off. And I thought, you know what? My daughter doesn't care which part of the world we live in, how much money we make. And mm. I had, because I'd done a startup, I knew that uh, the startups suck out a lot of your time, but they also give you incredible flexibility with what to do with that remaining time. And I wanted to have control over that. So my wife and I both quit our jobs, moved back to India. Uh, in fact, I incorporated the company, uh, the new company that I was going to start, uh, just uh, uh, on the way to the airport, uh, on the way to JFK. Uh, and reached back in there. We thought we'll be back in a year's time after setting up a team. Uh, we even put our stuff in storage in New York. And then one year became 10 years. So which is how, most, how these things typically play out. And then I ran that tech company, like a typical uh, internet company, building some really cool travel planning products. Uh, again, then uh, eventually ended up selling this company to India's largest uh, online travel company called Make My Trip, which is a publicly listed company for Amazon. I was part of a leadership team there, which is really fun because every quarter you had to go back to Wall Street analysts and uh, convince them that uh, uh, you're, you're, you're the best things in slight spread. Uh, but while all of this was happening, 2016 happened. And 2016 was kind of my moment of a lot of this coming together where Trump got elected, Brexit happened. Uh, my kids, uh, we were at uh, the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, I had an older daughter who could, uh, who could snorkel and see how amazing the reef was, but my son was too young to see that. And that year was the first of the years in which mass bleachings happened and 30% of the coral reef died, died that year. And suddenly inside me, there was this moment where I said, look, I've been kind of taking this for granted that the world will obviously be a better place for my kids. Uh, when that may not be true. I mean, borders might close, and which they have, by the way. Uh, we might just uh, destroy half the planet, which we are. And... Uh, uh, it just might be a lot more uh, warfare, hunger, disease that unfortunately looks like we're heading in that direction. There's lots of gloom and doom. And I, <laughs> really I mean, I could not sit back and just kind of wait for all of that to happen while my kids are growing up. So that was my um, aha moment. And then uh, last year, I just, uh, been, uh, just decided to ditch all of that uh, on my entire career in, in the internet space, or at least bring those skills. Uh, to try to solve for climate as opposed to just kind of sit it out and, and, and wait for things to happen to us. Fortunately for me, uh, my wife uh, decided to be, do a PhD as well, and she ended up uh, at Stanford again. So we, 15 years later, uh, we are back in student housing, back with creepy walls, <laughs> and in fact, wow. uh, back, back with uh, my, my favorite pastime from 15 years ago, which was uh, a mouse has infested our house, and every night there's a battle of wits that happen between us. <laughs> I'm not winning, but uh, yeah, here we are. <laughs> uh, I have discovered that I, I have had multiple, like a trilogy of sagas against mice and rats in my house, and I've <laughs> I have never won. Uh, there is there is no defeating <laughs> Sauron in in my house. It's just devastation constantly. I just basically end up moving. Was the answer? Uh, how, how's how's the food at Stanford versus Google? Oh, Stanford is really good, actually. Uh, okay, all right, cool. I want to yeah, make sure you're happy over there. Yeah, not complaining. <laughs> um, awesome. Uh, well, I, I, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. I think again, you know, for so many people who are who bounce around to different things and and bounce around to live in different places, and especially right now, are, are kind of looking out and going like, "What's next for me? Am I going to keep doing the same thing, whether they've got a job or not, or they're trying to find some way to contribute?" I think it's always helpful to to hear from uh, you know successful uh, endeavoring people such as yourself who who have done a bunch of different things and that informs you know how they're able to contribute later so excited to dig into that yeah yes absolutely. very much what a journey I'm already the successful part but uh, yeah <laughs> easy don't <laughs> we don't have to get, we, uh, we'll get in it's fine <laughs> all right uh, yeah let, let's do this we're going to um Anshuman, just so you know uh, provide some uh, quick context uh, about our question our topic today and then we're going to like Quinn said get into uh, action oriented questions and uh, and actions that we can all do to uh, learn about what's going on and help help fix it Sure, Brad. Um, awesome. Yes. Anshman, we, we do start with one important question to set the tone for this whole thing. And I'm going to adapt it a little bit today because I think it's time to do that. But instead of saying, tell us your life story, we like to ask, uh, Anshman, why are you vital to the survival of the planet as we know it? <laughs> Let me start with the, the answer that I discovered while when I had my midlife crisis. And then I'll get to more boring words. <laughs> 
the, uh, the midlife crisis answer was very simple, which is that uh, none of this matters. The, just the belief that you're important is, uh, is obviously illusion. But the good part about that, that realization is that it, it frees you up, it liberates you to then do what really gets you going right now as opposed to something that is driven by legacy or by impact or by success and so on. So having said that, what I realized is that uh, climate is a classic example of something that requires, that touches everything under the sun, uh, no pun intended, right? So it touches energy, agriculture, manufacturing, that's on the industrial side, but it also touches social justice, it touches uh, just the belief of uh, how we live our day-to-day lives and how much we consume, uh, how much we take from the planet and how much we, we give back. So it's both uh, very humanistic at one level, it's very deeply technological at another. There are uh, fundamental uh, psychological ways, but also economic ways of thinking about climate. So, but one thing which I realized was that uh, uh, each of these has become deep silos by themselves. So, for example, mm. if you are an uh, economics person, uh, then you might believe that carbon tax will solve all problems. That's it. There's nothing else that needs to be done. You just put the right number out there, get all the governments to accept it, and lo and behold, climate will be solved. Um, mm. If you are a, a Naomi Klein, a social justice, environmental justice person, uh, you might see them with a completely different lens, which is this is fundamentally a global north versus global south divide. It's a it's an example of hundreds of years of perpetuating the uh, the inequity that uh, developed countries have uh, on done on developing countries and on uh, uh, civilizations, uh, native civilizations all across the planet. And so, therefore, if you do, do this massive wealth transfer from the global north to the global south through some mechanism, uh, that will solve all problems. Uh, you might be here, somebody sitting in Silicon Valley, the, the land of innovation, and you might believe that, look, it's, I mean, 200 years ago, Malthus was also talking about how overpopulation will starve the entire planet and we'll all die. And look where we are, I mean, it's land of abundance. We have more food than we have ever produced per capita. So it's just a question of technology. It's just a question of innovation. You just uh, invent the right thing and these problems will go away. Now, Mm -hmm. obviously the reality is that all of these are true and untrue at the same time. And uh, what I felt was personally my role was that I have been very cross-disciplinary in my thinking. And maybe the small contribution that I could make was to build something that would bring all of these different kinds of thinkings in one single place, let people see each other, hear each other, work with each other, to solve the same end goal. And um, maybe that's my my reason for being on this planet. Um, well, it sounds very modest at best. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's it's so well considered. And um, and it, it seems like seems like uh, you might be the perfect person to 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 run this uh, this Hogwarts for for climate school. So I'm excited to, to dig into that a little more. Thank you for that. So Digging into that a little bit, just just some context for folks. For I, I assume Anshuman, you get some of the same questions that that Brian and I do, um, which is the most common of you know those of us who are involved in this in this climate fight, uh, at least from a podcast or a newsletter or whatever. Is you know, hey man, what do I do, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. and that can come from anybody. And there's often some confusion, some angst, some frustration involved. Sometimes hope, not usually, which under, is kind of understandable at this point. But, you know, depending on who's asking, you know, your, your parents, your kids, uh, your friends, your Uber driver, uh, a business colleague, someone you're giving a keynote to, right, uh, a mortal enemy, whatever. For the, those of us that have some context and some grounding in this, the answer for each person should probably be different, right? Because everybody's got different skills and, and different priorities. And that's, that's when we're trying to answer that question literally, which is like, what, what do I do? But if we back that up, I mean, at least as far as America is concerned and, and Anshuman, we'll, we'll dig in India too, because you had some really interesting thoughts on that. Um, and we've talked about a little bit here, but I want to go deeper. But I, again, at least we're, with regard to America, we're, we're failing to even educate the next generation uh, in, in 
the most efficient and practical way possible. So beyond like, what can I do? There, there's not an understanding there, literally a factual understanding. S states are still fighting over the science, which is insane. And, uh, you know, um, grade school curriculums and textbooks are all over the place. Uh, universities still have majors built around these mostly archaic verticals uh, that don't recognize the, you know, problems of today are opportunities for interdisciplinary training and approaches. But again, the point is like, we have to start with an education. We have to start with a context that's up to date and dynamic and founded on interdisciplinary facts. Um, so that's talking about our youth, but again, everyone else, like, again, like if we haven't made it clear over almost a hundred episodes of these conversations, uh, they're, they're sometimes directly about climate change and sometimes not, it, it's all one system. And when fighting the good fight is going to require all these people of different skills and, and endeavors and businesses and ideas, you know, the, the kitchen sink, uh, but we have to start with education. Um, and, and the question then becomes is what is, what is the best version of that? Are there different versions of that, uh, how do we arm them with this education in the most actionable way forward? And, and that's where I'm excited that this, this idea of, of climate school comes in. So that, that's the question I want to get in today is, is, is how do we teach about climate change so that people are armed with the right information going forward? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a very important question. And, uh, maybe even before I jump into that, let me point out two principles that uh, I think definitely apply to me, but also to everyone else, regardless of skills, background, where they live on this planet, and so on, that are relevant to the climate fight. And the two principles are, one, to understand that things are bad enough that no matter how much you do, or people around you do, or governments around you do, please stay dissatisfied. Uh, we have, we, it's, this is all hands on deck. And so therefore, don't uh, switch to plastic, uh, switch out of plastic bags and think that you're done. Don't uh, right. solve a specific problem or vote for a certain candidate and think that you're done. There is much, much, much more that needs to be done. So principle number one, stay dissatisfied. Uh, second principle, which has been very helpful for me, uh, not sure it applies to everyone on the planet, is to listen to your kids. One thing that I have realized yeah. is, uh, and I maybe I'll share an anecdote here, which is uh, my daughter, who was uh, almost uh, nine at that time, when I told her that I was going to quit and uh, start another company, which she was totally blase about because that's what she'd seen me start companies all the time. <laughs> but when I told her that I was going to be working on climate change, and her eyes lit up and she said, good for you. And I said, aren't you? Aren't you surprised because I don't really have any background in climate. Uh, and her reaction was priceless. And that's what I uh, implore everyone to, to keep thinking about. She said, well, what else would you work on? What else is worth working on? So that's Man. that sense of, uh, of uh, obligation that we have from our kids. And I think Greta Thunberg, the, the activist, the teenage activist from Sweden, she exemplifies it so well where she keeps saying, how dare you? And I think kids have this, uh, this, this right of ownership on us and on our time that nothing else can. Our, our politicians cannot, our patriotism cannot. So listen to your kids. And when they say that this is the most important problem for you to be thinking about and working on. So let's start there. And so if you have these two principles in mind, I think uh, the, uh, the next step is to get into understanding uh, what's really happening all around you. So... Mm -hmm. What I, I think the, the key thing that I realized is that uh, people will come at it from different angles. So mm. if, you are, if you are a high school kid, then what you, I don't need to tell you how important this problem is because you understand this even better than I do. What I need to give you is the right learning and doing opportunities so that you can start working on those problems while you're in high school. And the most important, the most effective ones that I think personally that high school kids could be working on is to understand what community organizing is all about. Uh, now, that if, if you look at everything from the, the local impact of what climate and in general you know, environmental inequities can do to your community, and you just pick up a piece there, learn why it's important, where it all fits into the grand scheme of things, and then get your peers and your teachers and your parents and your neighbors 
involved in some in solving that, that multiplied by a million times can become something really big. More importantly, it will start informing the political conversations around climate that your parents are mm-hmm. uh, seeing and that your the local politicians are seeing. So that's at one end, which is high school. At the complete sure. opposite end, uh, let me give the worst possible example uh, opposite of a high school kid would be a, a Goldman Sachs trader, right? A trader who couldn't care <laughs> less about any of this stuff, right? And yet, when, when they go back and look at ways to do their jobs better, one thing that they are going to recognize is that climate risk is baked into their portfolio right now. Everything that they've touched, whether it's real estate assets that they own, agricultural uh, commodities, companies that they own, uh, stocks in, industrials, energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You would mm-hmm. very soon realize that your portfolio is going to get massively hurt by climate unless you start understanding and learning what's happening in this ecosystem, what the science says right now. And the science is, the interesting part about the science is that uh, we're only seeing, I mean, first of all, 30 to 40 years of climate science has been surprisingly accurate. Back in 1979, right. when James Hansen talked about this, to now, the predictions have tracked really, really well with what climate scientists said. So if the past is some indicator of the future, the chances are that what they, what they are talking about the next 10 years, next 20 years, are also going to be fairly true unless we change our ways in a big, dramatic way. And what that means is that your Miami coastal real estate has underpriced the flooding risk, the sea level rise risk in a massive way. Your um, right. agricultural commodities have not really priced in how much the weather patterns would change and entire tracts of land would either become unfarmable or would require very different approaches altogether. And companies do not care to do that. So even as a Goldman Sachs trader, I would say that your career and maybe even your survival depends on understanding climate risk. So therefore, these are two extreme ends. And I don't think Terra, what we're trying to do with Terra is going to solve all of these or even 20% of these problems. In fact, our vision is that can we build something that allows educators to then build their own mini schools on top of Terra? Because you'll need all kinds of educators to come on board and start teaching all kinds of different people all across the planet. So that's that's kind of our vision for this. Yeah, that sounds that sounds awesome. Yeah, and and um, perfect because I want to get into to Terra more. Um, your your online climate school. Can you can you tell us a bit about how the process goes for for applicants and who's applying? Uh, you know, what what are their jobs? What are their interests? Uh, what are their education levels? Sure. So what you build is a twelve week online crash course or a boot camp in climate. So the people that uh, we've seen, we've, and we haven't graduated too many. This is literally our first cohort that graduated uh, about 10 days ago, and we're very thrilled about how that went. Uh, and the kind of people, first of all, who applied for the program are typically mid-career, but mid-career from all walks of life. So just to give you a sample of what kind of people were there, we had someone who was uh, who was a partner at uh, Techstars, which is the world's largest technology accelerator. Uh, graduates thousands of startups every year. And his reason for joining the program was to figure out how to get tech stars to think a lot more in terms of climate tech investing, in terms of sustainable investing. So this is a way for him to get better at his job and rope in the climate understanding to make sure that tech stars promotes those kind of startups in the future. That's one end. We would, then, we would also have the other end. A woman who has been an investigative journalist in India for uh, for 15 years has been reporting for CNN, worked at Facebook, and so on, and realized that a lot of the stories that she was writing had this environmental degradation as its underpinning. And she wanted to just zoom out and say, well, what the hell is going on here? How come I've run into these issues that they see intractable, both from an economic standpoint, from a social standpoint, and, and yet I don't fully understand them. What's, what's the best way to get there? So we have these very diverse set of people. So we had roughly 40% folks from the US, 40% from India, and 20% from the rest of the world, all online mm. and uh, often mid-career and all congregating together over this nine-week period. And, and, the, and the program itself is very uh, intimate, uh, so to speak, which is you have, yes, you have the standard videos that you can watch and assignments that you can finish, 
But the real fun part is an online community that we have built where people hang out for office hours every uh, uh, twice twice every week. And those office hours are we have a, a teaching assistant who has been a PhD in Berkeley who needs that. And ostensibly, the purpose is like any other office hours uh, in any other university, which is to solve assignments. But in reality, it turns very quickly into a social gathering because people come in and all of these people have strong opinions about their work and what skills they could bring to it. And therefore, they start chatting about projects that they're working on, the ideas that they have for climate. And it turns into this almost like this uh, peer, peer-to-peer learning uh, format that happens uh, every uh, week twice. We also have uh, uh, experts who come in. Now, experts at one end could be someone who runs one of the largest climate venture funds. And they look at everything from nuclear fusion to really deep technologies in all aspects of climate. That's one kind of a setup. And you could sit down with them almost like in a virtual fireside chat. And because it's a small class, you could talk to them, you could pepper them with questions and so on. But at the other end, in fact, almost the very next week, we had someone come in who was a Max SA Award winner, which is like an Education Nobel Prize. And he was the pioneer in everything solar. And his whole angle is not deep technology, but his whole angle is poverty and opportunity. He thinks, well, how do you get people who earn less than $2 a day to not worry about at least energy poverty? Very diverse sets. And that, I think, is kind of the beauty of the program, which is if you look at climate, you need to have almost this split mind where on one side you're worried about mitigating less carbon and whatever carbon exists in the air out there, sucking it out. That's one part of it. But the other part of it, which is at one level sadder, is adaptation, which is the realization that we are so fucked already, that it's so far along, that a massive uh, set of impacts of climate are already here and are unavoidable for almost 2 billion people on this planet. So how do you make systems that allow these 2 billion people to cope with climate change in a slightly better way? That's something that you that uh, that you also have to understand. And therefore, for us in Terra, it's very important to bring these two different worlds together. And that's why we have a very diverse, very global uh, class from day one. And that's the intent to keep, uh, to keep that going. I love that. And I, <clears throat> I want to hang out with these people for a few reasons, but mostly because, you know, I, <laughs> I'm sure you run into this and I imagine Brian does too, which is like, I find that I'm the bummer in most conversations. Uh, <laughs> people you know, love me when in people are like, it's this a ni-, is you. And I'm, they're like, it's a nice day. And I'm like, don't get used to it. They're like, oh, it's really hot. I'm like, get used to it. Oh, it's, you know, it's like just, uh, it's, it's hard. And you want to be a realist with everybody, but it would be nice to talk to people who, who's like, eyes don't glaze over, glaze over <laughs> like a shark every time I respond to them. It's just like, my wife doesn't take me anywhere anymore. It's just, it's, I'm the worst. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I love the focus on your students. And, and I want to talk briefly about kind of what it's like to have uh, kids right now and be taking action. I want to reach back a little further. Is there, you filled us in a little bit about your your family life and your and your business to get to where you are today. But is there, a, is there like a specific relationship or moment you can point to that was a, a catalyst for you to eventually do this? Like, I guess if you... If you look back and review, was there a was there a teacher or a parent or a moment or something like that that made you go, maybe this is the way I can do it to effectively become an educator? You know, I uh, never thought I would get into education in any way. Uh, my uh, and it turns out, I'm, especially I mean, my reason for not getting into education was quite simple, which is I'm a very uh, uh, hardwired internet entrepreneur, so. And the beauty of the internet is that the feedback loops are instant. You suck one day and you'll find out you do something great one day and you'll find out that very day. And mm-hmm. to me, right. education tells like, oh my God, it'll be decades before I find out that there's any impact. And uh, even then, there'll be so many confounding factors. Maybe the weather changed. Maybe Trump was reelected. Maybe the coronavirus happened. God knows what. So I don't even, I mm-hmm. never liked education such as a, as, as a business, as a, as, as a way of thinking about solving for the world. And lo and behold, uh, just these last one year has, has completely changed my outlook. Um, I think the 
my my brother who he, he runs Khan Academy for India and his whole perspective was oh, actually, wow. <laughs> yeah and, and hold on talk about having some influence holy <laughs> shit <laughs> no it's incredible and, and and to see uh what Sal Khan has done with Khan Academy and to see how well that translates from both Mountain View California to um, Mumbai India has just been remarkable and I can see that in my brother's journey in uh, in taking that idea of having a world class education for everyone so that's that's on one side I think the uh, the other aspect was that with coronavirus happening and schools all shut down I started uh, getting a little bit more antsy about how well my kids were actually thinking about the rest of the world and how what they were learning about it so I started the uh, and I didn't I didn't want to do the whole boring curriculum thingy at all. So I started running a small class for my daughter and her two friends, which was which would take up a topic that uh, they really were keen on. And I would do the research and then uh, work with them on assignments and uh, we would discuss all kinds of different things. And that ballooned into this very interesting uh, setup because obviously, I mean, these are 10-year-old girls, right? So they don't come up with topics mm-hmm. which are the ones that I would have academically studied, for example, the things that they were fascinated by was mm-hmm. crimes and murders and assassinations and mysteries. So wow. I, and, 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 and my feedback rating for every class that I would do with them would depend on how grisly and gory the crime was. So I would <laughs> reach back further and further into to all kinds of stuff. But just the idea that uh, you don't have to wait for years and years to see that impact. You can actually see that impact in the quality of the conversation that you're having with a student right there and then. And everything, I mean, just like in, in, in nature and climate, right? We can put a dollar value on so many different things, but can, we still don't know, even though we've tried, how to put a dollar value on forests and clean air and uh, a strong social community. That's the same thing with education, which is you can see somebody's life changing just by that wee bit in that one conversation, the one interaction that you had with them. You can't sum it up into some dollar number or some conversion number that uh, us internationals mm-hmm. like, but mm-hmm. is it just as impactful, even more oh, by far? That's definitely the, the case. So that's what converted me into into thinking about education in a big way. My my co-founder, I, by the way. Sorry. No, no, no. I I was just sorry to interrupt. I was just. It, it, you know, I, we've we talked about this. Like I, I I've got some kids too, and I've also got Brian, who's kind of the like same the thing. Kid. One of our most popular conversations, one of my favorite, was with uh, an author who's now the the uh, opinions editor for the Boston Globe, uh, Bina Venkatarman, who who talks in her fantastic book about being a better ancestor, mm-hmm. and uh, that that phrase kind of yeah it 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 finally and so perfectly encapsulated this modus operandi that I've been trying to hone in for a. A while, you know, and and has now become such as a, a, a guiding and more specific value for my everyday actions and bigger life decisions. And it it seems like that's how you talked a little bit about trying to pay it forward, you know, as the right thing to do. But uh, you know, as your daughter said, like effectively, like what else are you going to do that matters, you know? And and that's so fascinating to come from a a, a young girl who's, uh, you know, seen her dad. Uh, start and sell a couple companies and was raised in India and in America, which both have huge opportunities and huge problems that are endemic and, and, uh, you know, systematized. And it, to me, it seems like that is going to be really helpful, uh, you know, as you, as you ingrain that in again, like, you know, being the headmaster of a school effectively. Right. And by the way, I mean, just, uh, also to kind of, uh, Put, put the ball back on the other side. Expect your kids to be completely thankless about everything that you're doing. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. So, so, so none of that is. I mean, this is all at best what you can expect is to pay it forward. None of that is going to come back. So, just in your in your old age, when you're ruining the fact that your kids are not loving you as much as they should have, given all that you've done for them, just remember what I said. <laughs> That sounds about right. It sounds about. They'll ask me about. They'll ask me about my day or my job, and I'll, I'll be. Oh, thank God! And I'll talk for, you know, six minutes about it. And at the end, all I just hear is like, "Yeah, but can I get sprinkles on my ice cream?" Or is this one of those times I'm not allowed to sprinkles? I'm like, "Did you listen to anything? Like, I poured my heart out to you, and they just they couldn't." Sprinkles get. are important. Um, that that rings so true. Let's talk a little bit about framing these massive, interconnected, existential 
problems that we've made for ourselves as opportunities. You know, how do you frame the tone and the content of your curriculum to imply timely timeliness, but not send people down some very sad spirals? Because this this cliff analogy metaphor that everyone uses uh, can can be inspiring and actionable or like really depressing. So I imagine in trying to codify that through a curriculum has got to be a bit of a fine line. Absolutely. In fact, uh, we are realizing how important that is because the deeper you get into looking at the climate science and uh, the action or the lack of it that we have had in the past 30, 40 years, it can get you to go down some really depressing dark holes. And if you're not, uh, if you, and if the other parts of your life haven't given you enough fortitude to be able to traverse that and still get into action more, it can suck you in. So we are realizing that, and as part of our program now, we also do this mental wellness uh, class on how to think about uh, climate as a positive force of action, as opposed to something that is just uh, sucking you in. Yeah, but uh, let's get, maybe I'll give you an intellectual answer and then an emotional answer first. So mm-hmm. the intellectual answer is is this, which is how do you think massive social change happens? Right. So what's your theory mm-hmm. of change about that? What I have suddenly, the more I've looked at these movements and try to figure out, well, suddenly it seems like nothing nothing was changing for years and years and years, often decades. And then it seems like almost in the blink of a historical eye, the thing, like everything transformed. The equation just completely turned. So my, my thinking on that is that uh, what, what really happens is that uh, of moments of crisis like COVID are a time of incredible opportunity. And this is one of my professors here at Stanford, who I remember, uh, who unfortunately passed away some years back, a very well-known climate scientist called Stephen Schneider. And he gave this talk on climate, and this was due to the Bush administration, which is well, mm-hmm. no way compared to what the Trump administration is doing. And uh, people were all in doom and gloom about how the administration would never get around to actually doing um, and enacting some great climate policies. And the question to him was, how do you get up in the morning to do the work every single day with the same level of energy and enthusiasm? And he said, mm-hmm. look, what's going to happen is that one day things will suddenly change for some because of some external shock. And that external shock could be anything. It could be the oil crisis back in the day. It could be uh, some future energy crisis. could be, and he obviously did not know uh, coronavirus, but uh, something like this in the future. And what will happen is that suddenly you'll see half, half of humanity changing the way they live uh, in, uh, on a dime. So, and that's what happened with COVID, right? We haven't, I mean, we've changed so much of our social norms of what we consider acceptable versus unacceptable and so on in the space of a few months. And that will remain, that window will remain open for just a few months or a few years mm-hmm. when everyone would be open to something radical, something new. And at that time, the political leaders will look at their bookshelf, they'll find the section which says crisis X, Y, Z, and they would pick the book which is lying on the top of that shelf, which has the solution to that problem. They'll pick it up Mm -hmm. and they'll start implementing it. Now, I want my book to be on the top of that shelf. That's why I keep going to work every day to make sure that I have the latest, most updated information about climate science up there so that whenever the administration wakes up or whoever wakes up, realizes that this is the right way to go about doing things. And I feel I mean I feel the same way about COVID right now, which is, I mean, I come from India, right? So for me, what's happening in the US political system is nothing short of astonishing. The fact that uh, I mean if you had asked me in 2016 that in the 2020 elections there would be this fierce debate between the Democrats and the Republicans about who has the better Green New Deal. I would have laughed at your face. I would said, no way. That's, mm-hmm. that's, that's not happening. Right? Mm-hmm. No way. But, mm-hmm. but yeah, I mean, I mean, but look at the last three years. I mean, uh, policy entrepreneurs, uh, political entrepreneurs like Alexandria Garcia Cortez and others have managed to shift the debate into saying that, look, you can have development and jobs and climate action. In fact, they go so beautifully well together. They, they build that narrative. There are many holes to be filled out. But the fact that that somebody was plodding away at it for years and years and years without seeing any impact of that. But when the right moment came, now there's a $2 trillion plan 
uh, that the Democrats have, maybe Republicans will come up with something uh, uh, ambitious as well. Europe has definitely done that. So therefore, this entire world has shifted a little bit in the right direction, in my, I mean, in my hopeful belief. Um, I mean, look at, I mean, the other thing that I'm a big fan of is universal basic income. And uh, mm-hmm. I just, I mean, I keep wondering, I mean, if somebody had, if, except, like, a, a couple of Scandinavian countries tried UBI a little bit, but not really with their entire heart in it. If, right, right. I mean, Alaska did to a certain extent, but more out of uh, uh, compulsion than kind of a ideological way of, of doing it. But imagine if somebody had been plugging away at UBI for the past many, many, many years, built up a little bit of a community, small movement around that, and then suddenly COVID happened. I mean, in a way, the, the thousand dollar checks that they're writing, they are at the beginning of a UBI potentially, right? And sure. things could have sure. turned done if only we had examples, if only we had sufficient depth of thinking already built out on that. So to me, it feels like if you are trying to do social change, you have to bide your time. And a moment of crisis is the one when you have to be ready with your little movement, your little ideology. And that's how that's how things change. So therefore, to me, it's a very hopeful message to get up every morning and just get slightly better at my messaging and what we do and so on. Yeah, I think it makes sense. Uh, I mean, it, it it's practical, it's pragmatic. I, I mean, you know, uh, we've talked about this before and and uh, I've talked about it plenty of folks offline and online that nobody wanted uh, COVID, nobody wanted Trump to win. But if we're going to take something from them, it's it should be a lesson and and the time to react and rebuild and to rearm ourselves to go, OK, all of these incredible voting rights groups have popped up and mm-hmm. and groups to, you know, following the in the footsteps of places like Emily's List that have been around forever, run for something and swing left and 314 action to put scientists in office, you know, all of these places that wouldn't have existed if Trump hadn't won. And it's hard to see someone like AOC winning if the environment wasn't what it was. And now we have someone like you said, who's helped push this so far left that not only are we having these conversations and writing legislations with people like Rihanna gone, right. That includes black farmers and, and uh, you know, clean jobs for, right. for, for black Americans in Georgia, all, all of these things. But it's, we also have, because you know, uh, we, we have these, uh, the, the term limits and terms that people are in office. We knew, okay, well, let's, we got three years to get our shit together so that on January 20th, uh, or January, you know, whatever the date is, uh, at, at 12 1 PM, the debate has already been happening for years in the crafting of the legislation and the conversations and the understanding we can be so much farther along so that at that moment we were able to enact things that have been long in planning and, and, and much better understood than they were the in the previous year. So it's uh it's kind of a benefit. Obviously it's been a total disaster on just about every other front. But if we're but we have to see we have to frame things as opportunities if we're gonna if we're gonna move forward and, and if we're gonna make progress to to uh, get away from, from from where we are now. That's exactly right. And I think the emotional part of the argument is exactly what you said, which is that we we have to be better ancestors. Uh, and ancestors and stewards, ancestors to our children and stewards to this planet. And uh, what's the alternative? Uh, turns out that this is just such a much more enriching and meaningful way of living your day-to-day life as well. So why would you not mm-hmm. do that? Yeah, good absolutely. question. Thanks for being so positive and optimistic. My God, you're the best. <laughs> And now I feel like I need Anshuman to like record me a little phone message for yeah, every morning. Would you, could you do that for us, please? Thank you. It's like for for a week or two, I uh, I read Michelle Obama's book by listening to the audiobook because she recorded it herself. So the first thing I listened to every morning was her, and she was the last thing I heard before I went to bed. And let me tell you, it's a game changer. Sounds beautiful. That's fascinating. Awesome. Um, you, you know, yeah, I got to do that. <laughs> we can talk more about it offline. We've uh, we've had a few conversations uh, on Shimana on the podcast about what's happening in India. You know, most recently concerning the monsoon and the heat in the north, and what's going on, uh, uh, what all that is doing to to substance and farmers. I guess my question is, how can we all, and most specifically, I guess Americans, do a better mm-hmm. job of of taking just a, a more holistic view of, of what's already happening across, across the globe. Yeah, and that's a tough one. So just to give you a sense of what's happening in India, I think it's happening at a couple of different levels. One is that uh, you have 
some roughly 200 million people living on the coastlines uh, where sea levels are rising uh, and the way they, uh, they live their lives, the fisheries, etc., cetera, are, are all getting decimated. There are some 400 million farmers who are still reliant on the monsoons and the monsoons are getting disrupted due to climate change. So you have, in a country like India, the, the problem of, uh, uh, of taking half a billion people and re-employing them in a completely different sector. Unfortunately, at the same time, the Indian economy hasn't really done well. Uh, so therefore, there is this whole, uh, and this is even pre-COVID and post-COVID, again, there's a fork in the road, right? So for example, if you were to, uh, if the Green New Deal had existed in India, even politically as an option before mm-hmm. uh, COVID happened, maybe we would have gone down a different path. But the path that we are on right now is the worst possible mm-hmm. from uh, both a climate standpoint and from an equity standpoint. So even though coal is no longer a, jo- uh, a energy source that makes any economic sense in any part of the world, India does have ton of coal deposits, uh, not very good ones, but uh, they're all out there. And the Indian government has taken the stance that to bootstrap the economy, they will just uh, go down the coal uh, plant, they'll set up new coal plants and get a lot of capacity online, just focused on coal. And this is despite the fact that India has one of the most stunning success stories in renewables over the past uh, five to six years. So there is this whole uh, this problem, this dissonance uh, in the mind of what the mind thinks and what the heart uh, uh, wants in India, which is uh, quite bad. And I think the, the thing that I worry more about India and in other countries like India, like Bangladesh and so on, is that there are citizen movements haven't really coalesced into political movements yet. So there are no green parties in India or in Bangladesh or in Vietnam, etc. In, mm-hmm. in, in countries that have been affected by this, which have, mm-hmm. they're not even on the margins. They don't even exist right now. So, sure. um, so to me, it feels like the call to action in India, if you're uh, living in India or if you care about uh, country, how countries like India do on climate action uh, and in, in, in equity, is uh, to go out and build incredible level of mass awareness and a political movement around better stewardship of the climate and uh, uh, of the communities that depend on uh, climate being, uh, being, being normal. So, I mean, for example, at, at Terra, uh, as I said, I mean, our whole ambition is to allow educators to prop up in any part of the world to teach the thing that makes sense for that community. And one of the things that uh, we're thinking about and hopefully will build out is a journalism school for India, a uh, climate journalism school. Because in mm-hmm. India, the I think one of the challenges that we have is that the 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 mass of the public hasn't really connected the dots on what is climate and what is structural poverty. An example sure, that I was giving sure. uh, uh, Quinn earlier was that India has this very sad story of farmer suicides, uh, thousands of them that happen every year in Maharashtra mm-hmm. and other parts of India. And every time uh, the stories about them get reported, they get reported as stories of uh, uh, structural poverty, of debt, uh, mm-hmm. rural lack of development, and so on. But in reality, climate has been a primary driver for all of that all along, all these many, many years. It was a very interesting uh, yeah. Stanford study that showed that uh, India's GDP is already a third lower because of climate change in the past 30 years. Leave alone what's going to happen. Did you say, I'm sorry, did you say a third lower? Yeah, a third lower. Holy shit. And a third lower basically means life and death for a few hundred million people in India, right? I mean, that's you are yeah. the poverty line or subsistence line or not. So that is the cost that we're already paying. Now, the action on that, therefore, to me, is not to build out necessarily cool new technology or to try to build right. Tesla's competitor in India. I mean, that's fine. I mean, sure. Um, I think it has one place. But to me, the much more important thing is to get both mass awareness and political action started. And I, w- I want to pause you there because this is exactly where, where I wanted to get. And, and- we, we talked offline about this kitchen sink and how, how your school and, and education is a start, but, but obviously school alone isn't going to cut it like for everybody. We can't stop there. Um, so I, it, it's great, but I think this is perfect because you are explaining inadvertently or not 
how 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 this process should work. The, you're you're walking the walk effectively. This is again, you know, you're illuminating for folks on it, maybe unexpected ways or previously unexpected ways that after they get educated that they can get into climate work or whatever it might be in in a variety of different ways. And like you said, you never thought you'd be an educator and and uh you know you're 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 not a farmer and you're not a journalist but you you've taken this education this platform and now you've found a way specifically that you understand better than than better than someone else to apply it and i i think this is a great example of that so so please continue but i just want to help folks understand like this is exactly the thing we're talking about which is get the education and then find the way that you can have an impact that might be unexpected to you and might be unexpected to the community but could just have an enormous, enormous impact. Please, no, please continue. Absolutely, and in fact, uh, that is uh, that is the beauty of uh, of climate action, which is that because it touches everything, it needs every single skill out there. So no matter what you've done in your life, there is a place for that in solving for climate. And even in that specific example that I gave of the climate journalism school. Now, when we think of a journalism school, we think of people who want to be journalists to be going uh, into that school, right? But in reality, what online allows you to do is that if your passion is to communicate about climate, then you could come at it from very different walks of life. So, for example, even in India, maybe mainstream media is not even the place to uh, to target its, its button up the wrong tree. What you need to do instead is to get scientists who are sitting, for example, in uh, in, in in their own colleges doing research and haven't really had the chance to communicate what they're learning about climate in India, being able to do that, having the tools to be able to do that. You could be in an engineering college, you could be a machine learning data scientist, and you could start looking at a lot of satellite data that is coming in and is pouring in about India and start talking about how pollution is, uh, is spreading all across the country, uh, what kind of uh, uh, effects it has had on cropland, on pasture land and so on. And you could be a designer uh, and you might take, you might collaborate with that scientist uh, or that data scientist who has tons of data and try to convert that into a visual format that anyone who picks up a newspaper can understand. So there are these, all these beautiful collaborations that are possible with people with very different walks of life in that single microcosm of India alone. And now expand that across the planet. You could have, for example, one of my favorite companies, organizations, is this uh, nonprofit that is run off the coast of Cape Cod. It's called Green Wave. And it's this fisherman who has figured out this uh, amazing technique for taking uh, a small pod, a 30 foot by 30 foot by 30 foot pod that he drops mm -hmm. into the cold ocean currents and a kelp forest grows in. And kelp is one of the fastest growing sources of protein on the planet. And that kelp forest then creates a uh, uh, you know, lot more sea life all the way from the top to the bottom. And he can harvest that pod every three months and feed an entire village from that. It's a, so far so good. I mean, this is the this is where a lot of good ideas come to die, which is you do it in your own local neighborhood and it works for you, but by the time it gets to the rest of the planet, it's too late. But mm -hmm. what's amazing about, uh, uh, about, about Green Wave and this entrepreneur is that they're, they're trying to figure out how to get more and more people involved. And in fact, their sense of urgency is that Half of American coastline should be doing it yesterday. And there is about 10 to 12% of the, of the world's coastline that can have this approach to aquaculture happening today, which is significantly sustainable and so on. So how do you, now you're a fisherman uh, and you want uh, a fisherman or an entrepreneur sitting in India to be able to pick up this idea, license it, quote unquote, uh, or open source it and then, and, and then use that and build it out uh, along the Indian coastline. How does that happen? So for that, that is what Terra is trying to do, is that can we get people of all walks of life to come in and teach, but then not just to teach, but to also do, so that the Green Wave idea can very naturally transfer to someone sitting in India, someone sitting in Ghana, someone sitting in South Korea, and they build up their own businesses that are all affiliated to Green Wave in some way, or kind of from an open source movement. So that's... That's the vision of trying to get everyone on the planet to solve for this, as opposed to just a few of us sitting in Silicon Valley, a few of us sitting in Cambridge, uh, Boston, and so on. Sure. We had, didn't, did, didn't we have uh, Green Wave, you said, right? 
That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. We had uh, Brent. We had um, Brent Smith, Smith on, the yeah. founder. Oh, yeah. you did? Oh, fantastic. Good fantastic. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. great. And, and my, uh, my, and since then, and, and apropos of a few other things, my one of my brothers is asshole well started to get into uh, becoming effectively a, a, a middleman for the for the the future of the sustainable farming industry. Uh, so he's working with Brent on that stuff too. It's oh, there you there's go. a whole there's a whole just world to be. Ha- I mean, when he explained the job to me as someone who literally talks about this shit every day, I was like, wow, that would <sighs> never have occurred to me. And also, like, of course, that's necessary. You know. So that's yeah, I, I love it. I, that's incredible. I'm glad, and I'm glad that uh, this is already happening. Yeah, so awesome. And and yeah, I, what you just talked about is so so perfect because we I do want to get into uh, you know the the point of our whole thing, which is how do we uh, how do we help? How do how do our listeners uh, ask the right questions and and take the right steps, uh, action steps to to support um, you and the planet? So let's so let's do that. Uh, can we start with? with uh, our listeners and what they can do with their voice. What are, what are some big actionable um, questions that, that we can all be asking of our, uh, our government representatives? Yeah, I think, uh, so I, I see this as, almost as a three-layered cake. Great. And, uh, the idea Please, is, I love, love cake. cake. <laughs> but this, this is a cake where uh, you could start anywhere. You could build the top layer first. It's a very, uh, it defies all laws of physics. So if you could, uh, if you pardon me that, but uh, the bottom of the of, of layer of the cake is your own personal action. And uh, I, I won't uh, uh, pain you to death on this one, but just make sensible choices. Um, and sure. sensible choices, uh, a lot of them we don't be familiar with, which are uh, eat less meat, uh, see if you can uh, use renewable energy for your uh, electricity supply, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some of the slightly less usual ones are, for example, just consume less fashion. And in general, just consume less. Right? That's one part of it. And the yeah. idea is not just to, I mean, if you, if, you are, if you do the math within your own carbon footprint multiplied by a few million people, unfortunately, it does not add up much. But that's not the whole point of this. The point is that once you start doing this, it has this viral effect. And sorry for, I mean, that's probably a bad analogy to use in these times. But it has this effect of, to, on people around you that, that gets them to start doing something similar. And what it does is not that the, the carbon emissions, uh, the number comes down dramatically. What it does is that you start now building a bit of a political voice, which is starting at the community level, but then starts roping up at, the, at more of the, uh, at the city and the regional level than after that. So that's the second thing, which is that you, the second layer of the cake is to hold uh, people in power accountable. And people in power are not just your politicians. They are also your media, uh, for example. Uh, and uh, so the, the different estates, the fourth estate, the third estate, and so on, these are all people who, are, who should be accountable to you. So are they doing enough stories? Are they doing enough local stories? Uh, when there are, uh, when, when, for example, you have an election coming up at that time, you know, is climate action, and when I say climate action, you could boil it down to a local level as well. Is that something that they have thought about, if they have points of views on that, or at least to find out how well they're inclined to, to moving in that direction if there is a national policy or a state level policy on that. So asking those questions in town halls, asking those questions by writing into them, all of those are actions that I think have meaning uh, precisely for this reason, which is uh, it's not that one email multiplied by a uh, hundred other is gonna, is gonna suddenly change policy. But uh, if you look at social movements, you'll realize that a lot of power comes from being in the face of, uh, of politicians long enough, deep enough, and harass them enough, long enough that uh, they realize that at least they start feeling that this is an issue that a lot many more people in their constituency care about. To do that, that's kind of the second layer of the cake. I think the third layer is that, uh, which is kind of going back to personal action at some level, which is that all of us have acquired skills our entire lives that are useful in the work that we do. They, they could be soft skills, they could be hard skills that we learn in trade schools and so on. The great thing about climate is that all of them are applicable to solving them. And if you want, if you want an analogy of how this could potentially work, look at what happened, what's happening with coronavirus. So coronavirus threw up a bunch of these different sites where, by definition, all of us were remote, so we could not meet each other. And yet these websites were collaborating massive projects, which had hundreds, if sometimes even thousands of volunteers working, using their skills to solve for them. So it might be 
that someone is yeah someone is a software programmer and therefore they're writing this complicated contact tracing app but at the other end uh, you could be a designer and working with a scientist to take the latest uh, research report that has uh, that have come out and gotten published about coronavirus and working that into an infographic that can now travel much more widely over your social media you could be working you would, you could be picking up the phone and because you've done sales you could be figuring out what the different uh, PPE manufacturers all across the country are and build a B2B directory that anyone can reach out to in case of uh, in, in case they need to restock and, and uh, 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 any PPE. So there are all these n number of different ways that you could figure out how to solve for COVID. I think climate is like the mother of all COVID. Uh, COVID in some ways, right? Uh, uh, unfortunately, unlike COVID, uh, which I hope will be reversible, we will find a vaccine for it. There is no vaccine for for the climate crisis. Yeah. But exactly. it is all encompassing, and therefore use your skills, find your skills, and uh, and use them to solve for a very specific problem, uh, which goes beyond just being two hands and two feet, uh, and, and just being a carbon emitter. You have skills that you can use. So that's kind of the, my message on, and this is what we're trying to build with Terra as well. We are, I mean, there's a reason why Terra is not called Terra dot learn or Terra dot edu. Uh, it's called Terra dot do because the idea is to learn so that you can start doing stuff on the climate and that's what we're eventually hoping to turn out awesome yeah i love that terra.do that is such a that's like just lines up with our with our uh you know ideals over here is to fucking take action yep. yeah anshaman can you can you tell us about signing up for for terra what do our listeners need to do uh when should they shine up any any info yeah so we're uh, thanks for asking that we're starting our next cohort uh in uh on, on august 17th and uh, we would love to have people sign up and apply for the program. You just have to go to the website, which is T-E-R-R-A dot do. And you should see a big button there for, it says apply. Just click on that and tell us maybe in 10, 15 minutes a little bit about who you are and why do you think uh, a program like this might help you. And uh, we would love to have you as part of the program. And uh, just when you're, when you're also filling out the program, uh, the, the application, please mention that uh, you heard us on uh, on this podcast, and we'll make sure that uh, we can make it financially uh, viable for you as well. Because I know these are not these are not easy times. So we and we want to make sure that all of us have a, have a chance to be part of this program. So please please go to Terra to apply. Absolutely. Uh, I, I love that. Thank you. And and just a bit, so we're specific with people, the new cohort starts on August 17th. And, and uh, this is going to come out on uh, Monday, August 10th. Uh, usually, usually our shows aren't, 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 aren't intended to be super timely, but of course, uh, the one that came out today and, and this specific one uh, are. What is the deadline for signing up uh, was, for, this co- uh, for this cohort? So, so what you've done is that for this podcast, uh, we just, just want to make sure that people have sufficient time to sign up. So we're going to be taking in people all the way till August 15th uh, from this okay. uh, from this podcast. So please uh, come by. Great. And and folks, uh, as Anshuman uh, very kindly pointed out, and, and truthfully, it is tough times for so many folks, but um, the climate clock is ticking and we need you. If, if this is something you would like to participate in and you cannot afford to do so at this moment, uh, let us know and... Uh, Anshuman and I will will work it out and we'll we'll get you in there because uh, we need you. Absolutely, absolutely. Awesome. Well, uh, Anshuman, we don't want to keep you too Anshuman, much longer. Yeah, it's been uh, over an hour. How much more, longer do you want to hang out with us? <laughs> another, yeah, <laughs> another couple hours. I'm sure your kids aren't banging down the door. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no. <laughs> Seriously, this has been this has been really, really, really wonderful. Um, and and we cannot thank you enough for for hanging out with us. We have. A few more questions, and and we'd love, honestly, if um, if you have any recommendations for for other other uh, world changing humans like yourself, people that maybe inspire you or that are just out there fighting for a better future for all of us, please let us know. Uh, it can be now if if you got names on the top of your head, or you can just message us later. You know, it's so funny. I was gonna, I was, was going to mention Bren, and I'm just so thrilled that you were already having on the program. Yeah, I'll send you yeah, the link to the conversation. conversation. It, it was a it was a yeah. favorite. Um, it also included a gentleman named Tom Ford, who's doing yeah. something somewhat similar out on the West Coast uh, with the Bay Foundation. And um, 
it, it was a great conversation. And those two are, are doing pretty exceptional work in, a, in an industry that's really just that is both misunderstood and has incredible opportunity in front of it and is really just getting started. Anshuman, last couple questions. When was the first time in your life when you realized you had the power of change or the power to do something meaningful? Maybe it's, you know, it might sound a little late in life, but uh, it was during my undergrad years. Uh, so maybe, uh, I'll give you the backstory on that. So India, I mean, India's educational system is pretty straight jacketed, right? So, and I ended up going you know, to an engineering college, which is often the wet dream of most parents in India, at least back in the day. So it was pretty clear what the rest of my life was going to look like from that point on. And remember, I was only 18 at that time, right? So mm -hmm. uh, who I was going to marry, where I was going to live, what I was, what I was going to do for the uh, uh, next 50 years of my life, how many kids I was going to have, all of that was set in stone already. And uh, uh, then in my uh, second year, one of my seniors asked me uh, point blank and said, well, these are the four choices that you have. Uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to go and migrate to the U.S. and do your master's there? Are you going to uh, uh, work for a large multinational corporation here? Are you going to do your MBA here? And like some such boring options. And mm -hmm. on a lark, I said, no, I'm going to start my own company. And this guy laughed at me and said, of course not. That's ridiculous. And by the way, there was no concept of starting companies at that time. This is my that we're talking about in India. So I, to prove him wrong, I started uh, missing all my classes and taking a train ride to all parts of India to find the earliest people who were teaching entrepreneurship, uh, earliest mm. people who had uh, started investing in, in companies and trying to bring them on campus and uh, getting them to give a talk to people like me. I mean, one thing led to another. It was, I think the, book, the, the funniest example was there was this guy who had just sold his company to Amazon. Uh, for hundreds of millions of dollars, was uh, the poster boy for the Indian internet scene, U.S. citizen who had just moved back to, who, who, who was visiting India. And mm. I woke up in the morning and I saw the newspaper and the newspaper said, uh, Rakesh, uh, his name was Rakesh, uh, is going to be visiting the campus to meet with the director. And uh, there was no other details. So I called the director's office and said, can I meet with him? And they chewed me off. So what I did instead was I just put up posters of him all over campus, booked a 500-seater auditorium for him to give a talk, and then just waited outside the office for hours. And then finally, when he got out of the office, I told him that he had to come and give a talk to all the students. And he said, but I have a plane to catch. And I showed him the poster, and I said, well, you can't. Unfortunately, you'll have to miss that plane. <laughs> so he, he laughed hysterically. He canceled his ticket. He came over to the auditorium. And... It is still that that talk that he gave lit a fire on campus. It just I still I mean there's so many entrepreneurs who have come out of my my college who talk about that that galvanizing moment when they heard him, and I realized that I mean this is all just like I mean it started out as just trying to prove someone wrong, and then realizing that I kind of started believing in it uh, quite a bit myself, and then realizing that if I just didn't care as much about what others thought. There was enough and more uh, to be done there just by, by individual action. And of course, the, the way these things become more than just a moment in time is when you figure out how to build small institutions around them, uh, sure. ways of working. And that's what happened. So this turned into uh, an incubator at IIT Bombay and turned out I, my company was the first company in that incubator. And that incubator has had hundreds of successful companies coming out of that in the past 20 years. So, yeah, just uh, you never know what might snowball into something more interesting. That's fantastic. That Incredible. is such a ball. That is such a baller move. Um, <laughs> congratulations. I, I love it. Uh, just vigilante doing good. Yes. It's always fantastic. You're Batman. Um, Anshuman, who is someone in your life that has positively impacted your work in the past six months? I think there's a, I would say there's an economist called Kate Trauer. Uh, she's at Oxford. And uh, she came up with this concept of donor economics. And I'll tell you what I've been struggling with all this while, which was that on one side, you have uh, growth is good. And growth is good, not just in, uh, in places, developed countries like the US, but even in places like India, which is 
you need to the country to grow, the GDP to grow, to get millions of people out of poverty. And yet at the same time, uh, also this, uh, this feeling which that, I mean, a lot of this growth is coming at the expense of uh, the environment around us, the social relations that we have built and disrupted and so on. And I just couldn't figure out how to reconcile these two different ideas. And what Kate has done uh, with her book that came out, I think, almost eight years ago, that I just came yeah. across a few months back uh, for the first time, was marry these two concepts together into a single holistic framework of thinking, where I mean, she thinks of it as a donut, which is where the outside of the donut are the boundaries of the planet. So what the planet can support in terms of environment, ecology, uh, biodiversity, and so on. So don't exceed that boundary. The inside boundary is one where humans thrive, uh, or, or humans have dignity, they have equality, they have gender justice, and so on. So the right sweet spot for us to live as a species is in the in uh, is not in that hole. It's not outside the donut. It's in the middle, in the in the donut part of it, the, the yummy part of it. Hey. So, so to me, to understand that uh, this is how you think about growth is not good for its own sake. The purpose of growth is to let humans thrive, but thrive in an in a ecosystem which also takes into account nature and the planet mm-hmm. that we live on. Was, I hadn't seen, a, I'd seen squishy versions of that, right? So uh, spiritual sure. talks or, or, or stuff like that, but never an economist version of that, which I, which makes so much sense to me. So I'm quite indebted to Kate for her thinking on that. Yeah, it's a it's a truly fantastic, um, groundbreaking, and and such a compelling, intuitive uh, model and and book. I I, I really enjoyed it. We're uh, we're talking soon with um, a woman, a professor at Harvard, Rebecca Henderson, about her book, uh, Rebuilding Capitalism in a World on Fire, and uh, oh. I think you'd really enjoy that as well. Nice. Yeah, it's uh, sort of similar, which is, you know, we recognize that economies and, and capitalism and such uh, are going to keep existing, and but but we do need to fundamentally rethink them, and, and there's some really interesting ways to do that, but, you know, they do have to be driven by purpose. I'm going to check it out. Um, uh, Brian, take us home here. Thank you for talking about cakes and donuts today, Anjuman. I just want to uh, appreciate that. I love dessert. Just a delight. <laughs> it makes me happy. <laughs> um, uh, Anjuman, what do you do when you when you feel overwhelmed? What is your um, your self care? Your your Anjuman time? We like to we like to know what people are doing to take care of themselves when they're not taking care of the world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think kids uh, and. I, I'm definitely a kids kind of a person. So if kids are not your thing, then uh, I feel sorry for you. But uh, <laughs> what I love about them is that there's such a sense of uh, immediacy to their lives. So I mean, we just had, for example, a tragic loss in our family, and uh, we were and um, just so uh, uh, cut up about that. And my kids also uh, were they, they knew this individual in our family really well, and they were obviously distraught for a little while but literally a few hours later when while we were still moping uh, my son would walk in and say okay uh, I know you're upset right now but can we go out and play ball <laughs> and just that that sense that look I mean all of this I mean we're here on this planet for this very tiny blink of an eye and it might feel that our life is bigger uh, more important more uh, central to the plan of the universe than <laughs> It, it is. And uh, to me, it feels like kids have that uh, that ability to live in the moment that just takes you out from all of these massive burdens that you that we get, end up carrying on our shoulders. And uh, so just listen to them. Just uh, to be the, the most fun thing to do is to just kind of drop everything and go hang out, play, run, uh, just do silly things with them. And this, uh, yeah, that's the best antidote to, to the climate crisis as well. <laughs> Can you relate, Quinn? Yeah, yeah. Mo- most of the time, it's it's the greatest thing in the world. Um, it really is. It really is. Um, uh, Anshuman, we have an incredible uh, list of book recommendations from past guests uh, on on Bookshop, and the listeners can can find them all uh, in our show notes. Uh, if you could add a book 
uh, to that list. It's, it's books that we would send to Donald Trump. What book would you recommend that Donald <laughs> Trump read? Interesting. Donald <laughs> Trump. If, um, and it doesn't have to be a kindergarten book. It has to be. It, it doesn't no, have to be. No, but it it's understandable be. if it is. Okay. There's a new book out by uh, this um, Indian author called uh, Amitabh Ghosh. And it's called The Great Derangement. Oh, it's uh, this lovely good. book that uh, he's written about. It's actually, it's, lo and behold, it's about the climate crisis. But uh, the thing that I like, and like most of the other climate books out there, is uh, Amitabh is a, is a novelist. His job is not to try to uh, harass you with facts and figures and so on. His job is to tell a story. And um, one of the interesting things that was the motivation for him writing that book was that he said, look, uh, why do we Americans love our cars so much? Is there a chance that just because Jack Kerouac wrote that book back in the what, 60s or early 70s, which had right. a romance of uh, wind in your hair and gasoline in your nostrils and an open <laughs> road in front of you, right? That's how we end up loving these tin cans. But who has written the definitive work in narrative fiction for climate? Um, that starts making us believe about this individual identity and the future. So why don't I go out and write? It's a very personal story of what happened to him over the many, many years, which I thought was just like beautiful. It's just a beautiful story. And of course, it, uh, it underpins a lot of the, uh, the great derangement that we all feel living in 2020 as humans on this planet. Well, that sounds lovely. Yeah, that sounds incredible. Uh, we always talk on the show about how, you know, uh, inspiring people and uh, and making change is not just by telling them numbers and figures. It's it's sharing your story with them. It has such such more of an effect. That's right. Well, this has been uh, fantastic. Uh, Anshima, I really can't, can't, can't thank you enough for, for sharing your, your time and your story and your efforts with us. Um, I, I'm truly so excited to see where this all goes. Where can our listeners uh, follow you on the internet? Twitter would be best. It's my, uh, uh, my Twitter handle is um, B-A-P-N-A-A. And okay. uh, yeah, I hope to see a lot of you there. Awesome. So we great. will be. That's, that's all Brian does. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it and uh, look forward to, to talking with you soon. No, thank you so much uh, to both of you, Quinn uh, and Brian. You have such great questions and really appreciate what you're doing with the podcast. Uh, we're, yeah. we're doing our <laughs> best. <laughs> thanks to our incredible guest today and thanks to all of you for tuning in. We hope this episode has made your commute or awesome workout or dishwashing or fucking dog walking late at night that much more pleasant. As a reminder, please subscribe to our free email newsletter at importantnotimportant.com. It is all the news most vital to our survival as a species. And you can follow us all over the internet. You can find us on Twitter at important, not imp. Uh, just it's so weird. Also on Facebook and Instagram at Important Not Important, Pinterest and Tumblr, the same thing. So check us out, follow us, share us, like us, you know the deal. And please subscribe to our show wherever you listen to things like this. And if you're really fucking awesome, rate us on Apple Podcasts. Keep the lights on. Thanks. Please. <laughs> and you can find the show notes from today right in your little podcast player and at our website, importantnotimportant.com. Thanks to the very awesome Tim Blaine for our jamming music, to all of you for listening, and finally, most importantly, to our moms for making us. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs>